expose that. Correct. Once again, I had this big plan to go around and find these things in the real world and do a whole vlog video on it. Uh, I tried it, it went terribly well. So I'll come back inside to do it a little bit safer. I want to talk to you today, guys, about my car history. Before you click off the video, before you hit dislike and think this is the weirdest thing anyone's ever spoke about, really what I want to talk to you about is life lessons and how a lot of the most important life lessons you're going to learn, it's not going to be in school, it's not going to be someone sitting you down and bestowing wisdom on you, it's just going to come from situations that you run into. You're going to go through certain things in life and you're just going to learn from it. And my car history has taught me so much. So I wanted to share it with you because there, there's some funny stories uh, mixed in it as well. So this, this was my first car. And we found it. Uh, it was a Citroen C3 2006, uh, thereabouts. Uh, I bought it from a friend of a friend I picked it up from a scrapyard, which should have been my first clue that there was gonna be issues. And I paid very little. It was a great value buy. I saved a lot of money and I bought it very cheap. Uh, two months down the line, that car started to break down. And by break down, I mean the brake pedal wouldn't work and I'd be driving along and suddenly my brake pedal just hit the floor and did nothing. And it turned out that it was what's called a cat D write-off. And if you never heard of this before, cat D write-off means that it could be repaired, but the cost of the repair bill would probably outweigh the value of the car. So you're better off just scrapping it and going and buying another car. It will cost you more to repair it than it would to just get rid of it. Anyway, I didn't have much choice at this point because I'd spent my money or a lot of my money on buying it in the first place. So I ended up getting it repaired. And when you put all the money together that I spent on buying and repairing that car, I could have just bought a very nice car in the first place, or at least a half decent car that wasn't a write-off from a scrapyard from a friend of a friend. That is one big pile of shit. So the first lesson that I ever learned from cars and from my car history is where possible, don't buy cheap especially when it counts. So something like a car, I'm not telling you to go out and buy a you know top of the range Mercedes or anything like that. All I'm saying is, is I ended up paying for that car twice over. And I paid for it twice over because I tried to go for the cheapest possible option and it ended up costing. Don't buy too cheap because you end up buying twice. Spend enough that it's fit for purpose and it serves you for what it needs. And this extends far beyond cars to uh, equipment for your work, computing equipment, technology, I'm drawing blanks on anything else, but don't go, don't go too cheap. You end up paying for it in the long run. Eventually, however, I was lucky enough that I was able to afford to buy my second car and I'd learned my lesson from the first one. So I went and got myself a relatively new at the time, Ford, Focus Estate. Now, the reason I got such a granddaddy car in terms of getting an estate car, uh, I've mentioned before on the channel, I run a martial arts school. Uh, and I operated out of a lot of community centers. So I needed a lot of storage space to carry stuff, but I still wanted a car that would be relatively nice to drive and relatively cheap on insurance. This was my next car. And I loved this car. It drove nice, it had a decent size engine, the storage was obviously great, it was a very practical car. Uh, it served my purposes really well. The problem with this car was it gave me back pain. And I remember spending about a month adjusting this seat forward, backward, left, right, Every position I bought pillows, I bought supports, lumbar support things, anything I could do in order to be comfortable in this car. And it got to the point after about a year and a half of driving it, where the back pain had become so debilitating from sitting in this seat that I, I physically couldn't do my job anymore. Uh, I was like on the verge of tears from the pain because it was just constant. It was just all day. It got to the point where it wasn't just hurting when I was in the car, but it was then now becoming chronic. It was all day. 
throughout the day. Eventually, it got so bad that one day, I drove it straight into the first car dealership I saw, which happened to be a Nissan garage. And I went and basically checked what I could afford and what I'd get for it in exchange and picked out the first car that was fit for purpose that I sat in and didn't feel the pain, which is Paul. Yes, Paul is a maroon slash burgundy Nissan Duke and I hate Paul. I can't express to you guys how much I hate this car. It doesn't drive nice. It's not very comfortable, although it doesn't cause me any back pain. The speaker system's not great. Air conditioning is not great. The engine is not great. The rear passenger space, the boot space, it was a terrible car. And I don't mean this to sound ungrateful, by the way. I'm not trying to sound like a spoiled brat. No. You like no! I am eternally grateful to be in a position to be able to afford a car, be able to insure it, to have a purpose for driving one and need it. I'm greatly appreciative. I'm just being very candid with you about my experience with owning this car. And a lot of this came from driving the Ford, which other than the back pain, was everything I wanted in a car. It wasn't flashy, wasn't elaborate, it was practical, and it got the job done. This car is kind of the opposite. It stopped the back pain, but it's not practical, and it doesn't get the job done, at least not half as well as the last one. I could have never fathomed that Paul would have just started giving me, Paul, uh, the Ford, would have started just giving me back pain, but it did and it was bad and it left me no choice but to trade in the car. Uh, and that was unfortunate, but it was way beyond my control. And it taught me that you can only focus on that of which you can control. So I needed to trade that car in again. And once again, I'd lost a lot of money doing the trade in on that car and getting this one. And all I knew is when I sat in this car, the day I sat in it, I felt that the chair was different and I felt that it wasn't gonna hurt my back. And the lesson I learned from Paul, and the lesson that I continue to learn from Paul, uh, is something that I actually read in a really good book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. This is for all levels of people who are trying to get their, their financials under control. And in this book, one of his main principles are identifying the difference between investments and liabilities. So take for example, if you spend your money on a house, that can be an investment or it can be a liability. If it's the house that you live in, Although we often consider it to be an investment, it can often be a liability because you have to pay all the repair bills. <laughs> paying the mortgage or you're paying to maintain it, all the bills, etc. It's very expensive. Now, if it's a rental property, although you're paying those things, you're getting paid from that property in the form of the rent and obviously in the increased value of the property as well. An easier to understand example is if you go out and buy some Nike trainers, Adidas trainers, branded trainers, that is a liability in the sense that it doesn't earn you any money. It costs you money and it depreciates in value the moment that you buy them and walk out of the stock. The second you put those on your feet, they're not worth what they were worth when they were new in the box. Now, if you bought stocks in Nike or Adidas, then these would be investments and these could potentially earn you money rather than costing you. Now, one of the greatest liabilities you'll ever pay for in your life, guaranteed, is your car. I've experienced this through my entire car journey, but never more so than with Paul. Which recently, uh, which is a company that do surveys, customer satisfaction, they recently did a survey on this specific car and it was so bad and they found so many reliability issues that they actually called for Nissan to recall it. Uh, it was that bad of a car in terms of the build. I have replaced the brakes, the suspension, the transmission, I've had the front repaired, I've had the back repaired, I've had about six pieces of interior trim fall off and have to be put back on. This car has not been well made. This car has not been well made. And of course, every time I repair a piece on it, I think, well, I'll drive it for another six months, one year, because I've paid to repair it, and then I'll sell it. 
and then another piece would break and I'd get in the same situation. And it's now at the point where I've repaired so much of the damn car. <laughs> Again, I've almost bought it twice. This old broom has had 17 new heads and 14 new handles in its time. So it kind of goes back to the first lesson, but more than that, it's understanding that cars are liabilities. Don't get too excited about them. Don't give them too much of your time, your energy, and certainly don't give them too much of your money. They are a tool. Make sure that they're fit for purpose. Make sure they're fit for function. Get away from seeing it as a fashion item or a label of your status or your self-worth or anything like that. It's a car and cars are great, but they're just cars. Guys, I hope that was helpful. I hope I've covered some ground on that one. Whatever you drive, whether you drive, drive or not, just remember they're more of a liability than a pleasure. Please, if you haven't already, like the channel, subscribe to the channel. Oh, sorry, that clap was probably really loud. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you on the next one and I'll see you later, bye.